Today, today is a special day in the life of this congregation. Today is the day we come together and we acknowledge these 13 seniors who are graduating from high school. As they're getting ready to move on to the next stage of their lives, the next season, the next big thing. Uh, and we want you to know uh, that we celebrate with you. Our community at First Methodist is one where we try to walk hand in hand with one another. Whether it be in times of sorrow, times where we have to carry one another and bear one, other, one another's burdens, we try to be there next to each other walking. And in times of joy, in times of celebration, we stand next to you, affirming you and thanking you for your presence in our community. And we celebrate with this great accomplishment as you prepare to move on uh, to the next stage in your life. And I think it's neat, we have a group of 13, uh, and we kind of all got here in different ways. Some uh, were born in this church, they had parents and grandparents and even great-grandparents that might have worshipped here, and they were, they were baptized in this very room many years ago. Some over the past four, five, six years have come, uh, maybe to fusion, maybe to small groups, maybe on a retreat, and they have just kind of become a part of our family. And I want each of you guys to know, regardless of how you got here, you are ours, and we love you, and we are so thankful for you, and we are so, so, so very proud of you. Let's give a round of applause for the graduating class of 2016. About, about 10 years ago, I was finishing up graduate school, and I had to read a book called uh, When Hope and Fear Collide. And I, I was studying in education, we were learning about what the uh, typical American college student is like, and uh, I think this, this book was very appropriate for what you guys are getting ready to prepare, because it talked about that idea of going off to college and having that idea of hope and excitement, as well as a little bit of anxiety, maybe even a little bit of fear in the unknown, and where we exist in college at the crossroads of hope, as well as fear. I can remember packing up my, um, my Dodge Dakota. I had a black Dodge Dakota when I was in high school. I had a system in it. It was really cool. didn't have any rims, but it, it was a really nice truck. And I remember packing it up with everything that I owned getting ready to go off to college. I grew up in Gulfport, uh, and I went to school at the University of Southern Mississippi. And it's about a, about a 60, 65-mile drive of Highway 49. And I remember my mom standing out in front of the, the uh, garage, and she wanted to come so very bad to come and be a part of me moving into college and all that stuff. And I wouldn't let her. I wanted to go off on my own and to do it by myself. And I packed up all this stuff in my truck, and I, I, can remember, I can remember backing out of the driveway, driving through my neighborhood and getting to Highway 49, and I remember rolling my windows down, just kind of cruising down the highway, and I remember thinking, oh my goodness, where am I going and what am I going to do once I get there? That point of hope and fear is what I was experiencing as I was driving off to school for the first time. There was hope for new adventures, there was hope to meet new people, to have new experiences, to be a part of new things. And there was also hope for freedom. I was so excited to go off to college and be free. I know some of you, um, as we talked in earlier service, uh, if you grew up watching Nick at Night, some of you may actually have seen these shows when they came on TV. But when I was a child, Nick at Night was like My Three Sons and Bewitched and, uh, and all those shows. And I remember the Mary Tyler Moore show, I think it was, where she runs into the city and she does around and she throws her hat into the air as the theme music is playing. And I just, that image of freedom, I was so hopeful and excited about being free and starting that next chapter of my life. But in the in midst of that, there was, also, there was also fear. There was also a little bit of anxiety there. And I know you guys have got it. You may act like you don't. That's cool, but you do. It's in there. That little bit of fear and anxiety of where is it that I'm going to find my home? Where is it that I'm going to find people who accept me? The question is, where is it that I'm going to connect? And I know you guys are thinking about that now as you prepare for trips to Tuscaloosa and Starkville and Oxford and Mobile and all over, all over the place. Where is it that I'm going to connect? And I think that's a question we all ask ourselves, church. That's not just solely upon our 18-year-old graduating students. This is a question we ask ourselves as we meet new people, as we move into new communities or new neighborhoods. Maybe we get transferred in our job. There's that anxiety within us. Where is it that I'm going to connect? Because I think at the end of the day, we can all agree that we want to be loved, that we want to be accepted, that we want to connect to something. Now this morning, I know many of you are here. You're here to celebrate these fine young men and women. Some of you had no clue that it was Senior Sunday until you were handed your bulletin about 15 minutes ago. And I know as soon as you walked in and you were handed that beautiful spread of their pictures, you thought, okay, this is cool. I can, I can be here for this, Senior Sunday. I've watched these kids grow up. But in your mind, you immediately dismiss the sermon. 
you were thinking, this is Senior Sunday. He's not going to say anything at all that is relevant to me or where I am in my life. And I ask you, I ask you, stay with me. Many of us are here, newly graduated from college. Some of us are here, we're newly married. Some of us may be here this morning and we're inching towards our 35th or our 40th class reunions this upcoming summer. I want you to know that this morning there's a message for each of us. So over the next few minutes, over the next 10, 15 minutes, don't zone out. I mean, don't start thinking about this afternoon, about the nap or the rainy weather. Don't start thinking about watching baseball. Some of you might be tempted to think about the glory days of your own high school experience for the next few minutes. And, you know, last night was prom. These guys went to prom last night and woke up and got here. Let's get them a round of applause for that. Some of you, some of you might be thinking of your glory days at your prom. I want you to stay with me this morning. Because there's a message in this. As we honor these 13 students, I want you to know that this morning, this morning, it's about you, but ultimately, this morning is about us worshiping our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Today, today is about Jesus. And you're here this morning because you find Jesus intriguing. Some of you might have moved into the posture of seeing Him as your Lord and Savior. And you're down on your knees professing your faith in Him. Some of us may be here this morning, we're trying to figure this thing out. We've read this book, we've heard these testimonies, we've seen people witness, we've heard about the great works of Jesus Christ and the saving grace, and we're still trying to figure out, is this, is, this, is this the real deal? We're here this morning with questions, that's okay. You're welcome here as well, and there is a message in this for all of us this morning as we study the words of Christ. The beautiful things about what Christ says, the red letters in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they were spoken to fishermen, they were spoken to farmers, they were spoken to religious leaders. Jesus, no matter who he spoke to, he met them exactly where they were. So this morning's message, as we study the words of Christ, is relevant to graduates, and it's also relevant to grandparents. Stay with me this morning. Let's pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for this day and the celebration, the time to be together in community. God, we thank you for these 13 students and the impact they have had on our families, on our lives, on our community. We celebrate them as they move to the next stage, God. And we ask that this morning that you remove all the thoughts of what's next from our minds. That we may be here in this place. That we may open our ears, our minds, and our hearts to your word. That we may learn what it means to be who and what you were calling us to be. Father, in the midst of this, I pray that you remove me from the equation, that I am long forgotten, and that you are remembered, as you are the source, as you are our Lord and Savior. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. This morning's lesson comes from John chapter 15, and if, if, if you've ever read John, uh, this comes in the heart of the, uh, what we call the discipleship chapters. We've seen really in the first 12 chapters, Jesus is kind of out with his disciples doing things, teaching them and showing them what it means uh, to go out into the world and to save the last, the least, and the lost, to heal the broken. Um, but here, we see that Jesus now is in the upper room. Uh, and as we get to chapter 15, we know that they've come together. They've had a meal. Jesus has talked about, this is my body that's going to be broken for you. He said, this is my blood that is shed for you. We know that he has gotten down on his knees, that he has taken off his tunic, and he has washed the nasty filth off the disciples' feet, teaching them what it means to be a servant. We also know in chapter 14 that he has talked about this idea of the Holy Spirit. He has promised his presence to remain with the disciples in what was coming next in their lives as he was leaving. We've seen Christ in this section of passage, this, this passage of Scripture. He has said, I am the bread of life. He has said, I am the good shepherd. He has said, I am the gate for the sheep. He has said, I am the way the truth, and the life. And in the midst of these comparisons, of all these things, as he has established his identity to this group of, of 12 men, within that, interspersed in the text, is this theme of connection. No matter what was Christ was doing, saying, healing, or who he was around, he was always relating things back to his heavenly Father. And this theme of connection, and you guys stay with me, is huge in the passage this morning. No matter where he was, he was saying, if you know me, you know the Father. Another time he said, I and the Father are one. He said, I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. In chapter 14, verse 20, he said, I am in the Father, you are in me, and I am in you, as he promises the gift of the Holy Spirit. Again and again, Christ outlines this idea of connection. We even see this thing called the Trinity unfold kind of really early in the text. 
as he talks about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that they are all intertwined and they are connected to one another. Now keep in mind he's talking about connected because he knows the family dynamic of this group of guys is about to radically change forever. Because in the next couple chapters, the passion occurs, Jesus is arrested, and these disciples now become out on their own. So here, in the closing time they're together, he is teaching them what it means to be a disciple, and he is hitting it hard with this idea of connection, that you must be connected to me. He says it again and again, because he knows what is coming next. The family dynamic is changing, and I know for you guys, and even parents, you realize your family dynamics is about to change. Just as those disciples were sent out into the world to go and be and do, your students are about to be sent out into the world to do the same. They may not be moving 30, 40 minutes away from home, but they're not going to be here anymore. They're going to be off on their own experiencing that Mary Tyler Moore freedom. And we want them to be connected to Christ. That's why in everything that Christ said, in every comparison he made, he connected himself to his heavenly Father. This morning, if you've got your Bibles with you, I invite you to open them uh, to chapter 15 in God, uh, John's Gospel. We're going to look specifically at verses 4 and 5 and just unpack a little bit of the meat of what Christ is telling his disciples here in this passage. In 15 verse 4, he says this, Remain in me as I also remain in you. He's looking at his disciples and he's saying, Make your home in me and my home will be in you. Another way to think about this is he's saying, abide. Abide in me, and I will abide in you. And this is that language that he's talking about, the Holy Spirit. And I want you guys to know that we all long for connection. We all long to be connected to something. And here's this invitation saying, Christ is saying, your home is in me. As you go forth out into the world, you are to be connected to me. I want to tell you guys something. In a couple months, you're going to show up on your college campus, wherever that may be, and you're going to get there and you're going to get unpacked and put up your matching headboards and all that stuff, and you're going to get ready for what's coming next. You're going to walk outside of your dorm room or your residence hall, and it's going to be like you step foot on the Las Vegas Strip. There's going to be flashing lights all around you of thousands of different things screaming at you, asking for your attention asking you to come be a part of this and to come be a part of that. Some of it's great and some of it's not. And we have to understand as we go forth that the world, the world is competing because the world wants you to make your home in the world. And Christ is saying, no, remain in me, not the world. It sounds simple. It sounds very elementary. If I were to bring my little girl, Anna Joy, who's all of three up here now, and I say, Anna Joy, where is it that you live? In the most adorable little list ever, she's going to say, Jesus lives in my heart. And it'll make your, your heart will just melt when she says that. It's understood by a three-year-old that Jesus dwells within us. However, when we get to college, when we get to new experiences and places that are unknown and unfamiliar, sometimes we are overcome by all the shining lights that are around us. My prayer this morning is that you remember to remain in Him as He remains in you. I wasn't perfect when I went off to school. And I wasted the better part of my undergraduate years because I was, I was grabbing at this light and grabbing at this light and blown away by this over there. And before you know it, I was making my home in the world. And I wasn't making my home in the Word of God as Christ invites us to remain in him. Continuing in verse 4, he says this, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is one of these passages where Jesus is a little redundant. He's saying the same thing twice. I can imagine him in the upper room looking out a window saying, You see that vine over there? You're like that and you must remain connected if you're going to do anything and produce fruit. And then he looks at the disciples and says, and you guys aren't going to do anything unless you remain connected to me. Now, I don't know about you guys, parents in the room, but has anybody ever had to tell their kids something twice for them to understand it? Jesus is kind of laying this out for the disciples saying, listen to me. Listen to me. The first time, hear this. The second time, hear the same thing in a different way so that you understand the importance of connection, to be connected to the Father. And let's remember these disciples... As we've read about it, especially in the Gospel of Mark, we see that these guys, they don't always get it right. James and John over there arguing, hey, Jesus, we want to see next to you so everybody sees us up in a place of importance so that they'll be like, look, look at James and John, they're important. We see the disciples walking with Jesus right after he says, hey, guys, 
I'm about to lay down my life for you, and I won't be with you anymore. They're like, yeah, that's cool, Jesus. Which one of us is the greatest? We see Matthew in the same breath after Jesus says, yes, you recognize who I am, Matthew, uh, 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 Peter. You recognize who I am in, P in, in Matthew chapter 16. Then Peter says, whoa, you're not supposed to suffer. Like, he, these guys, they have a hint of arrogance. They have a hint of confusion in all that they do. And Jesus recognizes his crowd, which is why he probably tells them twice, so that they would get and understand what it means to be connected. What it means to be connected. Because when we take arrogance, when we take arrogance, pride, and confusion, and we put those together into one thing, it's a dangerous, dangerous, dangerous thing. And Jesus is addressing that in this passage. I want you to hear this. Our hopes, your hopes, our hopes, our dreams, our desires, our ambitions, our passions mean nothing unless they are connected to the mission of Jesus Christ. I want you to think about those words for a second. This isn't just for them. This is for all of us, myself included. Our wants, our desires, our mission, our hope, none of that is relevant at all unless it is firmly connected to the mission of Jesus Christ in the world. If it's not connected, we're approaching the gospel with arrogance and with confusion. And that is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Christ is calling us to remain connected to him. Going on in verse 5, he says this, I am the vine. You are the branches. Here we see Christ giving us some language, identifying his role. He is the vine. We are the branches that are connected to him. And if you know, you've read the passage, this is a common passage. If we look back to chapter, uh, to verse 1, we see that Christ says, it is my father who is the gardener. He is the vine dresser. He is the one who is in heaven overseeing the vine. So we get this, these roles that are lined out. We've got God who is the gardener taking care of the vine. We have Jesus who is the vine itself. And then he identifies us as the branches that are meant to yield fruit in the world. God is the one that nurtures and sustains the vine. You know, we have a misunderstanding of vines in our culture. We're tree people. Everybody loves a beautiful oak tree. Everybody loves looking at hardwoods in the fall, magnolias, persimmons, hickories. Magno we love seeing trees. It's all about the vertical and the tree. But when it comes to vines, a lot of the time, the horizontal growing plants in yeah, vines and they got thorns on them. They choke out flowers. A lot of, I know a lot of you guys do yard work and stuff like that. You help your parents and your grandparents. And it's always during this time of year, go trim back all the weeds and the vines that are growing. They're killing my rose bushes. We, we don't treat vines with much respect. But I want you to know, as you hear this story, if you were to place yourself in first century Palestine, a vine would be of something of utmost importance. It would be something that is required for us to take care of, to nurture, to be around and help grow so that it produces fruit. These guys ate a lot of fish. They ate a lot of olives, and they ate a lot of grapes. And grapes grow on vines. So when they heard this passage about the vine and branches, it wasn't like you guys thinking, man, I cut those things down and threw them away. This was something that had meat on the bone for them. Because grapes were sustenance. That was what gave them nourishment in their lives. That was what fed them. And when Jesus says, my father is the one who prunes and cleans the vine, they were hearing this thinking, yes, he is the gardener. Jesus, you are the vine, and we are the branches. My grandfather, I, I lived with my grandparents for a little while when I was in elementary school. And uh, my grandpa, who he, old school, loved to grow his own vegetables. We had a, he had the whole thing, a couple acres. He had the big, uh, the big garden planted. He grew potatoes and all, all sorts of stuff. And I can remember going out there with him after school and during the summers and seeing the way that he loved and the way that he cared for all the things that grew in the way, it's almost like having pets, the way that he nurtured these things. And he was so excited when they would produce fruit. I remember seeing that. When I hear, when I hear that God is the gardener, I, I often think of my grandpa. God far exceeds him, but I just want you to think about how, how much it takes to, to love and to nurture those things as they grow. My grandfather also loved to graft. I don't know if anybody knows what it means to graft something, but literally, in my limited understanding, it is taking one branch from one tree and connecting it to a branch on another tree. And it's, it's a pretty cool thing. And I remember my papa had this pack of stuff, looked like an Indiana Jones sack with knives and all these different things in there, and he would take these branches off one tree, and he'd bring it over here to this other tree, and he'd put it on there, and I can remember riding the bus home from school, second, third, fourth grade, and I'd, I'd look out the windows as we got close to my grandparents' house, and I'd look up, and there's my papa, 25 feet up in a tree, hanging on a tree, putting these branches in, and every day he'd go back and check, and he'd wrap them up and insulate them, and he would water these branches, and it took meticulous care 
to oversee the growth of these branches. And here Jesus is saying, guys, our heavenly Father is the gardener. He is the vine dresser. If we allow him, he will come in and prune us and cleanse us so that we can produce fruit. Going on in the rest of the chapter, in the rest of the verse, it says this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, here's that language, that connectional language again, and I in you, you can bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. As this morning's message closes, I want you guys to hear this. And if you take away anything, I want you to take away this. Um, as you move on to the next stage of your lives, that you, you 13, all of us included, but especially you guys right now, because y'all are kind of in the limelight and we're celebrating you, I want you to know that you are God's chosen instrument to produce fruit in the world. You are God's chosen vessel to go forth from this place to produce fruit. That is our end, to produce fruit in the world. The fruit's not necessarily for our consumption. We produce fruit for the world. I want you guys to know if we read Scripture cover to cover, we look from Genesis, go all the way through the Revelation, we see God's plan of salvation unfolding. God created His creation. His creation rejected Him. The Old Testament, the gift of Jesus, is the story of God reaching out, wanting to love and be in relationship with His creation. And as Jesus sends forth His disciples a few chapters later in John, He's saying, now you guys, you are going to continue the mission that I have begun. Now it lies within you to go forth. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you're going to go forth as branches and you are going to produce fruit so that the world is transformed by your presence. I want to say again, it's not your dreams, your hopes, your wants, your desires, your passions. It's about aligning that with the kingdom of God and recognizing that that is our mission. As you pick majors and degrees and think about grad school, you can do a variety of different things. However, the mission to produce fruit for the kingdom of God. He closes in saying, apart from me, you can do nothing. That's a tough one. That's a tough one to hear. It really is. It's a tough one to read. Jesus looks at his disciples and says, boys, you can't do it without me. We look back in, uh, in verse 2. He says this, my father, who is the gardener, he prunes and cleanses the branches that produce fruit so that they will produce more fruit. But the ones that don't produce any fruit, he cuts away. In, chat, in verse 6, it says this, that those that are cut away or dropped on the ground, they wither, that they're picked up and they're thrown into the fire. So we have this idea of connection. To be connected to Jesus, to be connected and live for him is to produce fruit into the world. But if we're not connected, we're not connected to him and we're not seeking his will, then scripture explicitly states that we're moving in the wrong direction. That God, God is not getting what God has called us to be if we are separated from the vine. In closing, I want you to know this. We read this passage through the lens of Jesus and our relationship with him. And that, that's the way I think it's supposed to be read. We can also read this passage through the importance of community within our lives. If we're not connected to community, then we're withering. If we're not connected to a community of faith and being challenged and being fed and growing, then we are withering. Last Sunday night, uh, Emma Rose, we, we, we had the, the seniors come forward and uh, some of them spoke and shared about their experiences here at First Methodist. Um, and uh, she, uh, she sat up there and uh, she, uh, she said, guys, this, is, this has been my home. This has been my home. And, uh, and I'm a little nervous about what's next. And I immediately was like a baby crying, crying my eyes out. Um, because I heard those words and the way that she's been connected here. All of you have been connected here. But I also hear that hope and fear, that fear of what's next and where am I going to find a home and a place. And I want to tell you guys this. As important as it is to remain connected to the vine, we need to also remain connected to the community of faith. That you guys go off wherever it might be and get involved on your college campuses. Enjoy college, but get connected in a community of faith so that you can be held accountable, so that you can continue to grow and help others grow as we seek to produce fruit in the world. The last thing I would ever want for any of you is to go off and not remain connected to the body of Christ, but to seek to do it on your own. It doesn't work that way. We weren't created to go out and do it on our own. We were created to do it in community with one another. And just as we walk with one another through times of sorrow, 
and we celebrate with one another in times of joy. That is what it means to be in fellowship with the body of Christ. And when I read, remain connected, I'm hearing that as well. And that, that is my challenge for each of you. Love you guys. We're so proud of you, and we are so thankful for you. We ask as you go forward that you remain connected, knowing how much Christ is working in you, and that he intends for his plan to come to completion through you. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.